Well, Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord, and we just ask now, Lord, as we open a, a new book and continue this story of the Thessalonica church, Lord, that you would bless our time and you'd be blessed in us giving you our attention, Lord, as we hear what it is that you wrote through Paul and these other men. Lord, help us to make application for our day and to uh, not miss anything that you have for us here. So we just yield this evening to your purposes. We ask that your spirit would have his way here. And, uh, we just thank you in advance, Lord. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we finished First Thessalonians a few weeks ago. Continue with Second Thessalonians, much smaller book. Probably only take us a few weeks to get through it, but uh, I don't know that for sure. Tonight might be a short study, just going to get the first chapter done, but just some background, some things to be thinking about as we come into this. Paul wrote this book, Second Thessalonians, while he was in Corinth, and the best we can tell, that was around the year AD 51, and he wrote it within months of having written the first letter to the Corinthians, so there's not much time between these two letters. And the subject matter here is very similar to the subject matter that was in the first, the first letter to the Thessalonians, just really addressing some things that had come up that was causing them problems there. And it's believed that Paul received a second report from that city detailing these continuing questions or problems regarding the end times. And remember, Paul wasn't there in Thessalonica very long. We were told in 1 Thessalonians that he was there a matter of three Sabbaths, which tells us roughly three weeks of time. He taught them a lot, and he continued to teach them through these letters, and they were certainly a challenged place when we see the things that happened there. Because it seems that in Thessalonica, there were those that were deliberately misleading these new believers, false teachers, we would call them. And they were actually presenting fake letters, fake credentials, as if they were from Paul, telling the Thessalonian believers that the day of the Lord had already come. Now, that would have been especially troubling to them because Paul had encouraged them in his previous letter that the Lord would come for them before the day of the Lord, before the wrath that, came, that was to come upon the earth. And so that would be a horrible feeling for us as well. <laughs> if suddenly, somehow, we were convinced that it already happened and we were still here. I remember years ago, and I don't remember what building I was teaching in. I don't think, it wasn't here. It was in my journey of different buildings that we did church in. We were, don't, I, we never did find out what the source of it was, but in the midst of the service, all of a sudden there was this blast, and it sounded like an instrument. It sounded like a trumpet, and the whole room froze. And I broke the ice by pointing to someone and asking, could you go down the road and check another church and see if they're still there? But uh, So we could just imagine how uncomfortable it would be to believe that, especially you know, young believers not knowing everything they needed to know yet. And these men were probably rather convincing. So Paul took great care in the second letter to make sure the Thessalonians understood their views on the end times. And Paul explains to them that this future day of the Lord had not come yet, and he gives reasons. He gives biblical reasons. He gives scriptural evidence that he had not come yet because amongst those reasons, the fact that a certain man of lawlessness, who we know as the Antichrist, had not been revealed yet, which one is, is one of the criterias before the day of the Lord can happen. And it's also mentioned there that there's a mysterious restrainer that will be removed. And you may say, well, why do you say mysterious? Well, it's been a debated subject throughout history of who is the restrainer that needs to be taken out of the way. Most have concluded, and I don't argue, that it's the Holy Spirit. But, you know, sometimes I, I find that a rough one to believe because I don't see how the Holy Spirit could leave the earth. He's been here since the beginning. He's been here since creation. And people will still get saved during the tribulation period. So there has to be conviction. So I'm not saying it won't be the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's some manifestation of the Spirit in the church itself that changes. 
I've read good arguments that the restrainer is Michael because he's the protector of Israel. And Israel is going to be dealt with during that time. I'm not saying that's not, I'm not saying that's true either. Matter of fact, I'm just going to leave it open to being mysterious. And, uh, but it will happen, whatever it is, it will happen because scripture says so. So through this letter, Paul taught the Thessalonian believers that their hope in the future return of Jesus should be their encouragement as they face the tribulations that they do. So let's jump in, verse 1. It says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty typical opening for Paul, his greeting. Very similar to the one we had in 1 Thessalonians. We see Paul listed with the same men that he was associated with in his ministry in Thessalonica. Um, Silvanus and Timothy, both very close co-workers of his. Timothy, of course, kind of Paul's spiritual son. I'm not going to go over again their histories. I mean, we did that in 1 Thessalonians. And of course, them as believers, positionally, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, that's two names, it's two c- characters, personalities within the Trinity, and yet when you read it in the Greek, it's very clear that Jesus is not separate from God, but is God, and yet explained as we know in the Trinity as being another personality within that Godhead. Verse 2, again, part of the greeting, grace to you and peace from God. When you look at those words in the Greek, they become much richer. It's not just grace, and I shouldn't say just grace, because just grace is better than no grace. But we should never say just grace, because grace is amazing. Grace is more than we'll ever know, I believe. But here in particular, it speaks of a sanctifying grace. And remember, we're saved by grace. Nothing of ourselves. And so it's a sanctifying grace that Paul is pointing to, a grace that sets us apart. And that's what happens when we're saved. And it's supposed to be the process we're involved in believers all through our walk with the Lord, being sanctified, being set apart. And then the word peace here, if we were to express it in the Greek, again, it would be a tranquilizing peace, something that just puts you so at ease that it has to be supernatural. Something that just puts us in a place that, is beyond our understanding, surpasses our understanding. And so he moves on, verse 3, and he says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So Paul, and I'm just going to keep saying Paul, not mentioning all three of these men, because I think it goes that each of them could have done this. But Paul was able to speak with pride, to boast among the other churches of God about the Thessalonian believers, and in particular, their patience. Their patience. You know, that's one of those characteristics of the Holy Spirit working in a believer is patience. It's something most people struggle with. It is the one thing that most baby believers are told, don't pray for. Don't pray for patience because then you're going to be challenged in every way to have patience. I remember being told that as a baby believer. I had a friend of mine and I asked him, what are you praying about? He said, praying for patience. So I said, I think I'll do that too. And I told some other believer that's what I was doing. And they said, don't do that. Don't do that because you're going to, you're going to get tested. But yet, It's listed in the fruit of the Spirit. It's something that should be natural in us as believers, and yet it's definitely a work in progress, I think, for most of us. And that word patience here means steadfast. It means that they persistently endured. They had a firm faith in the midst of all the persecution and distress and the lies, and they endured it. And that's what patience does for us, the patience that we're given by the Spirit. It's able to endure the things that come. And because of this, Paul says they were morally obligated, him and these other men, they were morally obligated as those in debt to give thanks to God for them. I think it's one of the things that marked Paul's ministry and really just him as a man is just how much he prayed for those churches 
that he set up and put men over. He always went back when he could. He always made sure that they continued to be discipled. In addition here, Paul notes how their faith was growing greater and they were unselfish in their increasing love towards one another. You know, I was reading and Mr. Spurgeon had an interesting take on growing your faith. Mr. Spurgeon is famous for not taking prisoners. And he said this, he said, in lines with the, the, the thought of growing your faith, he said, do all you can and then do a little more. And when you can do that, then do a little more than you can. Always have something in hand that is greater than your present capacity. Grow up to it. And when you have grown up to it, grow more. And that's really a testament to our Christian walk. We're never done. There's always more. There's always more. We wouldn't be here if there wasn't more. If we had somehow attained to that final level, then I'm sure the Lord would bring us home. Look at verse 5, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So Paul's looking at them and he sees them standing up so fearlessly under the persecutions and afflictions. And he sees that as an indication of God's righteous dealings with them. God was supporting this church. God was strengthening them. He was encouraging them. I think we could attest to seeing the same things in us as a church. And if they had not received his divine power, they would have never been able to demonstrate such patience and faith and suffering for Jesus. None of us can. We need his power in order to do that. Paul says they are counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Let those words sink in. He tells this church, you are worthy of the kingdom of God. I was thinking about that. I read that several times over as I was studying, and I thought, what an incredibly humbling thought. And then I thought to myself, I would never want to say that about myself. But I can, and so can you, because it has nothing to do with our personal method, met merit. It has nothing to do with us. So we can say it, because it has everything to do with him. And as such, we can own that. I mean, it's only through the merits of Jesus that anyone will be there. And those who suffer on behalf of the kingdom need to know they're among those who will reign with Jesus on that coming day. And that's a place that we can comfort others when they're going through things that are tough, tribulations, challenges, crises. Those especially that are suffering for their witness, for their work, for their calling, for their ministry. That, that doesn't disqualify them. It doesn't make them less of a Christian. Matter of fact, it probably adds a couple more crowns when you get there. Listen to these words Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. He said, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. There's something about suffering that actually brings us more in line with the calling that all Christians have. There's something about suffering that actually has us walking closer to the Lord, especially when we're suffering for his sake, then we share in his sufferings. But that's one of those taboo things. We don't, we don't really think about that, especially in the Western world, that somehow we're called to suffer. That's everything that we work against. And yet as believers, we're called to, depending upon your individual calling, but I think all of us collectively called to suffer for the, for the case of Christ. Because this world doesn't accept it. This world's not going to make it easy to walk that walk. So there will be suffering. But again, I think that's kind of why the church got weak. Because it didn't want to suffer. It wanted to be like the West, rest of our culture and look for comfort only. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, If we endure, 
we shall also reign with him. And there's always that picture of enduring, that picture of walking out that patience with God in our ministry. Look at verse 5 again. There we read these words, manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. Now, the righteous action of God can be seen two ways. Punishment for the persecutors, and then rest for the persecuted. One commentator said this, he said, God's action in allowing his people to be persecuted and in permitting the existence of their persecutors has a double purpose. First, to test the fitness of his people for government, and second, to manifest the fitness of their persecutors for judgment. I find that really interesting. The things that God's working out as he allows the things to go in our life that we would probably erase if we could things we don't really want to be there. And yet he's testing both those being persecuted and those that are persecuting. To see, to judge them, to be fit, to be in that line. Just proving themselves. And I know which of those two places we want to be, and we need to make sure we are. We want to be the persecuted. And you're like, wait, wait a minute, where'd that come in? We want to be the persecuted? Well, I don't want to be a persecutor. That's up to God. And so... Sometimes these are uncomfortable truths. You know, just as God will administer punishment to the enemies of his people, so he will reward rest to those who suffer for his sake. Look at verse 8. In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So there's three words there. Verse 8 starts off in flaming fire. I mean, that's an image I think we could look at two different ways. One way is as a reference to God's Shekinah. The, the cloud of his glory that accompanies his presence. Now, you may have heard of that term Shekinah before. You may not have. You just have. Um, you won't find it in Scripture. The word Shekinah is not there in Scripture. Matter of fact, the rabbis pulled that word from their language to try to describe that presence of God. And the actual definition for that word, what's that word mean? Shekinah it means he caused to dwell. And we see so many examples of, the, of what we would call the Shekinah glory of his presence. Always so powerful. Always just as powerful as you might imagine it. And when I think about God being present, and as he was, especially in the Old Testament, you know, the power that he came with, the witness of that must have been incredible. And when I think about that, I always think about all the places in Scripture where somebody has an encounter with an angel. And what happens every time? They end up on their face. And the angel's like, uh, get up. Get up, you don't want to worship me. But I always think that they're just a created being as well. They're just one of God's creatures. And if that's the reaction a person has to an angel, what must it be like to stand in the presence of God? Just one picture that I pulled out from Old Testament, Exodus chapter 16, verse 10. It says, Now it came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. You know, there's all those other pictures of that, that cloud is kind of filling the temple, not even allowing a person, not even one, to get in with that glory. You know, so I always think, when I think of that in the New Testament, I just think of what we call the transfiguration. When Jesus was there on the mount with his three capadres and he appeared in his glory. And their reaction was intense. They never wanted to leave. They wanted to stay in that presence. You know, the other picture of this fiery, this flaming fire is the fiery judgment. The fiery judgment which is about to be unleashed as Paul is pointing to that day. 
A couple images that we see of that, Psalm 50, verse 3, says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very temptuous all around him. And then Isaiah 66, verse 15, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots, like a whirlwind, and to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So likely the latter, this judge picture of judgment, is what's meant here, but it could be both. It could be good. It's not like he's going to leave his glory behind when he comes to judge. And of course, when I think of that image of God, just I can't help but think of the fact that we're told that he's a consuming fire. A consuming fire. So when God takes vengeance, it's not, and we need to make sure we understand this, it's not an act of mal- malice. It's a righteous compensation. In God's vengeance, there's no thought of getting even, but rather administering punishment, which God's holy, righteous character requires. His character demands that. There's no really choice. And Paul identifies here two groups that we read that will meet God's vengeance, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says they shall be punished. That means it's a guarantee. That means that there's no out for those that fit either of those criteria. One commentator observed, a God who doesn't punish sin is no God at all. The idea that a God of love must not punish sins overlooks the fact that God is also holy and must do what is morally right. And then it tells us here that the punishment is an everlasting destruction. Now that word translated as everlasting, also sometimes as eternal, is used 70 times in the New Testament. There's three times it means ages of limited duration. The other times it means eternal or endless. It's used in Romans chapter 16 to describe the unending existence of God, but it never means annihilation never means annihilation. It means a loss of well-being or ruin as far as the purposes of existence is concerned. When we consider this teaching of Paul, it's interesting to put it in the context of how the Thessalonians would have understood it and how we understand it now. For the Thessalonians, the promise of rest in the Lord and the kingdom of God, as well as God's vengeance upon their enemies, that was entirely in some future time. As they were being taught this, those things hadn't happened yet. But God was, but Paul was assuring them that both those things would happen. The rest of the believer, the punishment of the non-believer. And when we look at this today, we see that the promises were fulfilled. The Thessalonians to whom this letter was written, they've all died. Pretty sure. And they're already enjoying their rest in the Lord. And their persecutors have all died, and they're already suffering. So these things aren't, they were future to them, but now we look as things unfolded from the time of the cross. And it's more and more, I've been talking about this, how so much of what is going on with these people was going on with us as well. The perspectives aren't that different. Our experiences aren't that different. We're just in different time frames watching them unfold. Now, the wording here could make it sound like Paul is saying that these conditions will not take place until Jesus returns. And that's what he's trying to clear up with them. But Paul simply means that at Jesus' return, these conditions will be seen and understood by everyone. The world will see that the Thessalonians were right and their persecutors were wrong. Believers will be seen enjoying rest when they return with Jesus in glory. The destruction of the Lord's enemies at the end of the tribulation will be a public demonstration of the ruin of all who have afflicted God's people throughout all ages. Let's read verse 10 again. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So when Jesus comes, he will be glorified through the changed lives of those who have accepted him as Savior 
and have been set apart, sanctified for his purpose. And, and we're being told there that he'll be marveled at by all those who have believed because the testimony of Paul and his associates was believed and it was trusted. Verse 11. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this chapter, Paul has been explaining the calling of believers. And he says we're called to suffer persecution, which in turn fits them, fits us for rule in the kingdom. And now he prays that in the meantime, their lives will be counted worthy of such a high calling. And again, we walk that same walk. That as we wait for that day when he returns, that we need to have a walk that counts and that we need to show ourselves worthy of that high calling that he has called us to. And that they will be enabled by God's power to obey every instinct to do good. And there again, all of our efforts to do good have to be empowered by God. Because in so many cases, our nature goes against that. And we want to be able to complete every task undertaken in faith. That's what he wanted for them. That's what I believe he still wants us for us today. Now, if Paul's prayer were answered, two things would happen. First, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in them, and meaning they would give a true depiction of him to the world, thereby bring him glory. And the second thing, they would be glorified in him. Their association with Jesus would bring honor to them as members of his body. But you know, when you think of all this, It's entirely a work of grace because this calling for them, this high calling for us, apart from God's power, as I said a couple times, is impossible. Impossible. And that's why we are to be so thankful on a daily basis, maybe an hourly basis, for his grace and his mercies. Because he spares us of the things that we deserve. He gives us much of what we don't deserve. The places that we're weak, he's strong. Places that we can't be loving, he can through us. And you just think of all the places he fills in. And so that's really, this whole thing that's being called for here is just, I think, a place that if we move in that area, we'll just see God's grace and mercies more and more. Because if we move in these things, if we attain to that high calling, what we're really going to prove to ourselves along the way is how weak we are and how desperate we are for his strength. But that's a good place to be, emptied of ourselves and full of him. So we'll rest there for tonight. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. And Lord, help. thank thank you for helping us make application, Lord, to see ourselves in the story and the calling is not just for them, but is for us as well. And Lord, there's also the, the warning here, Lord, to be wary of false teachers, to not let in things that are not of you and not of the truth of your word. So with that, Lord, we need to ask you for wisdom to which you say you'll freely give. So we ask for that, and we thank you for the grace and the mercies that you give, Lord, that we just spoke of. Lord, it is amazing that we sang of you being our friend tonight, and yet you're our king king and a friend. Thank you for all those relationships, Lord. So, Lord, I just ask you to get us home safe tonight. Prepare us for tomorrow. Just pray that you're blessed, Lord, as we give you our love, and we thank you for the blessings you give us. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.